topic for our conversation is uh, is really something I think we can all weigh in on when propaganda masquerades as news. What is the impact on our social fabric? To talk about this, uh, we've got uh, General Romeo Dallaire, who uh, is the founder of the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. Uh, he was also... Um, Interestingly, uh, uh, with the UNAMIR mission in Rwanda, UN's mission in Rwanda in 93, 94, and we have uh, author and essayist uh, John Ralston Saul, who has also been elected the president of the Penn International Forum, uh, and he was in that role till 2015, uh, a very vocal advocate of the right to free speech and very concerned about the way uh, the media is manipulated in these digital times that we inhabit as well. So thank you both very much for being part of this conversation. Um, General Dallaire, I'd like to actually start with you because uh, the one thing we keep hearing about um, the, the concerns raised uh, with the state of the media, particularly broadcast media, uh, all over the world, and I can speak definitely for the Indian media landscape as well, is they are just Radio Rwanda. So we hear this a lot nowadays. Uh, as somebody who served in that mission, who, ha who understands the impact of the way technology and media was used for propaganda and violence, um, can you draw those parallels today? I think it's an interesting a question because uh, 25, 26 years ago in Rwanda, the only real means of communication uh, was in fact the radio. And compared to what we have today is quite a crude system. However, uh, it was uh, the instrument that not only initiated, but sustained uh, the ultimately mass atrocities and the destruction of other human beings and set the scene for the mass involvement into that horrific situation. So you, you, you have the capability there, even with the older systems, where the technology was not more advanced, the people were dependent on that information, became absolutely absorbed by it. Uh, and so uh, it wasn't interactive, so they simply took it and took it and took it. Today, the, the sophistication has rendered it even more, uh, more effective and effective both negatively and positively more effective because you have instantaneous interaction also. So you can still sustain that level of information right down into a face-to-face -face breathing human beings, uh, real-time exchanges and coalescing a whole bunch of people together, as we're just doing now uh, in one, one thinking. But uh, you can uh, pursue it to the extent where using the visual as well as the audio, uh, audio uh, amplify this uh, hate or whatever discriminatory uh, uh, information you want to provide. And you can lose the control of it as it can escalate so rapidly into the dangerous sort of incitement and in fact uh, uh, the discriminating the dimension of destruction of, of human beings. So, so you can implant in the minds real pictures as well as words to reinforce a sustained effort uh, to destroy on the negative side. Question that we do have is what about the other side of this thing? How do we make this weapon of destruction turn into something that we can defeat and, in fact, overwhelm uh, for good? And that is still very immature. Right. Um, John Austin saw, you know, that, that's an interesting observations from uh, General Dallaire's, you know, the term also that he's used uh, for propaganda in the media, this weapon of destruction, maybe of mass destruction as well. Um, Yet, uh, the media journalists have had a very critical role to play in uh, the uncovering of, of ugly truths or, or working for the public good. We're seeing, uh, or do you think rather, let me ask this as a question, do you think that we're seeing the values of what journalism is meant to be and what 
the media is meant to stand for really being turned on their head and manipulated because we're seeing a broad uh, sort of backsliding of democracy and democratic principle. Uh, can I do this in three parts? And I, and I, I, sure. I, don't, I want to do this really fast, but I mean, I think the first thing is, I agree totally with what Romeo said, but I think it's important to remember that somehow these things turn, what we call hate speech and what leads to these murders turn very, very fast. And they seem to hook onto <clears throat> not just the type of media, but simple images and simple words. And if, if you look at the history of, of hate speech and violence against minorities, if you like, it's almost always been done almost the same way. So that when you go back, you know, when you go back to say the 1850s, you find that it's done enormously with cartoons. And cartoons play a gigantic role. I mean, the Nazis used cartoons in a very big way. People are using cartoons again in a very big way. And it's always the same thing of, of coming up with an image which allows people to denigrate and humiliate and feel less of a particular group. So that mechanism has always worked. The other is very simple uh, pieces of speech which are deep in our psyche, which are somehow signals to us. So we know that when you start talking about a group, as was done in Rwanda, uh, but done by the Nazis, done before that, and done today uh, as insects or some relationship to insects or um, kafa, what is that in English? Um, oh God, um, you, you know, that's always, uh, that seems to be a sign of, uh, of, the, of how you designate people as being, uh, lower than normal and you can kill them right so, so i think that's one thing i think the second thing is that that um uh, and and here I, I want to really just go to something as former president of penn remember this is 100 years old it is the only international organization which brings together writers and journalists for 100 years and you know it's dealing with like 800 writers in prison over 200 writers being killed every year and journalists and so for six years I basically spent my time seeing really awful people and trying to convince them to release people, not to kill people, to give drugs to people. It's, it's an enormous, it's like the United Nations with even less money. Um, and, um, you know, we have a, a charter from the 1920s and the charter says, we believe, and this comes to your journalist question, we believe absolutely in unlimited freedom of expression, right? The job of writers, the job of journalists. One, two, Writers, journalists must not engage in uh, provoking hatred. So they go together, those two things. And so it's, it's on the one hand, absolutely unlimited freedom of expression. On the other hand, at no time is it justifiable as journalism or as literature to provoke hatred. And that's how you, that, that, that difference between a journalist and a propagandist, a, a promoter of hate speech. And, and I think the third thing is, is quite simply, and it's the negative of what, of Romeo's sort of very necessary positive argument, which is that the whole world of the internet was thrown open to a lot of users in a very idealistic way. Finally, we're free. Finally, nobody's in our way. And frankly, that was a very naive idea. That was never gonna work because of what I've just said. There will be people who will take advantage of it. And on the other side, the owners who never had any interest in freedom of expression, who always were only in the business of making money. And so they were unwilling to admit the reality that they were editors and publishers, just like a, just like a newspaper or a television or a, or a radio person. They were editors and uh, they were publishers. And so you get the Rohingya crisis, which is entirely you know, largely, I should say, the responsibility of Facebook because they allowed that campaign of hatred to be carried on against the Rohingya through Facebook. They allowed it while pretending that, oh, no, no, we're just a place that people go through. We're not editors. We're not. So, so that's where I think the journalists took a long time, the real journalists, to understand that this was a deep and profound lie. Now people are pretty close to understanding. 
Right. I, I mean, that, it's interesting that you make that case because we're actually in the throes of a controversy in India as well, surrounding um, uh, the kind of content that social media platforms are allowing on their pages or taking down, as the case may be, depending on complaints. And there's, you know, the accusation is that there is a tilt towards power uh, and there is a tilt towards the right. And, you know, it, it's in the process of a of a heated debate over here, much of it, uh, many of us analysts and journalists also feel uh, uh, is tied in with what's happening in the United States today and how that election campaign itself is playing out and how uh, social media is being used for that election campaign by um, uh, US uh, politicians. Uh, but General Del uh, Delaire, you know, this, this point of, of social media and technology, you know, your experience uh, in Rwanda and your experience of, of the media that you were talking about is about um, more traditional forms of media, television, radio, uh, the newspaper, and even if it's the internet, it is, uh, you know, sort of mainstream digital media on the internet. Uh, we know about the power of amplification that broadcast has, uh, but that, I mean, it's, it's at the speed of uh, light, the speed of sound when it comes to social media and as uh, you know john has pointed out the the fact that they don't see themselves as as uh, responsible uh, for the kind of material that they put out there they're not claiming or they don't want any editorial responsibility i i would like to, to say that uh, you you're quite right in they're throwing material out uh, without necessarily wanting the responsibility of its impact because sometimes I'm, I truly believe that the nature of the impact that they uh, are creating is even uh, beyond what they think is possible. Uh, and uh, that is to me an indication that this whole new ability of the, the globe to communicate with humanity, all of humanity, not just you know, by, by region, but that you can communicate with humanity is a new phenomenon that, to which we're trying to grasp, uh, well, how are we actually influencing humanity? And who is being influenced the most? My arguments have been mostly uh, that the youth are the ones who are the biggest users, the most effective users also, and they're the most innovative users. And I speak of those under 30 sort of thing who continue to ma massively use this in, a, in all sorts of, of dimensions, including letting their own life be exposed to the world without realizing to what extent that is. And so because of that, uh, I think that we are looking at this maybe a bit too narrowly in as much as that there are no more borders in the world when it comes to influencing the world it's it th there's no more limits to uh, the artificial or the, the concepts of nation states and things of the past the question is is can nation states can we actually influence it really influence it or are we sort of picking at it uh, should those who have created this capability be those who can influence in restraining it, maturing it, and producing new countermeasures to affect uh, how it's being used in, in a very dangerous way, because it can go from simply hate speech, which is not illegal, but can very rapidly escalate to the more dangerous sides of, of, uh, uh, of hostility and violence, and in fact, incitement. Right. Uh, John, I want to come back to you with a, with a question. Your comment has me thinking. I mean, you know, you made the point about the, the patterns in which um, speech against a, an outgroup, let's call them an outgroup, is created and designed by those who want to uh, get the public to see them as somehow lesser mortals or less human or whatever. I, I think the, the question I have is while we, we can understand or we can ascribe motive to the kind of people and the kind of ideologies that are promoting or provoking this kind of hatred, um, I'd like you to weigh in on why and how such kind of content actually finds its mark. 
what is it about this content that people actually um, believe in the kind of stuff they've seen or they hear or they read, even though uh, their own life experience is stacked up with examples that do not support this? Why do we want to believe the worst? So a tiny uh, thing in advance of that, the, you know, one of the explanations for why I think it was uh, Romeo who said that you know they don't actually understand or I've forgotten now which of you said it don't understand how big the impact is going to be of what they let loose the owners you have to remember that the owners the, the five or six people who control and the people around them who control the internet are essentially very similar people they're you know they're Californians you know, they're, they're not particularly well educated. Uh, they're libertarians. They're libertarians. They do not believe in government. They do not believe in control. So they have a very naive understanding of how the world works. And they actually believe that self-interest is the only thing uh, that really matters. And most of them have virtually zero experience outside of their, the United States and probably very little experience outside of the Western United States. So the level of ignorance among the people who control this and have to spend billions of dollars of their profits on putting in place the mechanisms to lessen what happens when it goes out there. These are not terribly interesting people. They have a technical skill, but they're not interesting people. They're not people with enormous skills, with enormous knowledge. They don't know the world. They don't understand that a couple of generals uh, following the, his, the normal history of the Burmans in, 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 in Rwanda, wanting to undermine the democratic movement, can find a right-wing crazy monk and his followers and get him on Facebook and get him to start saying these nutty things and that this will lead to murder. At the beginning, they don't really understand that. So in a way, they're different from, I think, Romeo, the people that you were dealing with in Rwanda who were doing it very consciously I mean, the people owning the, the, the internet companies are different, not the people who are actually using the internet. They're not different. People who are owning it are different. They're not up to the power that they've got. And they're gradually being forced. And I th think this comes to Romeo's point of what we need to do. They're being forced into spending a reasonable percentage of their profits to limit what their uncontrollable machinery, the damage that it can do. And, you know, so, and your question really is, you know, this is the history of the world, which is that, you know, all human beings, I mean, Romeo, tell me what you think about this too. I mean, all human beings have within them, you know, good and evil. We all have good and evil in us. Some of us are truly evil for some reason, and some of us are saints, but most of us are somewhere in between. And, and we, can, we can slip one way or the other. The evil can be brought up or the good can be brought up. And what's been happening with this um, unregulated use of the internet is that it has been far easier for the forces of evil to use it than the forces of good. And so we're now faced with how do we strike back against, you know, and it, this could be religious, it could be ethics, it could be morality, it could be decency, it could be secular, but it's how do the forces of what we could call good, uh, occupy the space that they need to occupy to get some control over how the internet is used. And it is this, this age old battle really between good and evil, which the, the people on the side of good have been very, very naive for 20 years about how this machinery functions. I don't know, Romeo, what you think of that. Uh, Sorry, I don't before, think Yeah, no, but before uh, Jenna Derek comes back in on that, I just want, you know, as, as a sort of follow up to the point you've just made, um, of this battle between the forces of good and evil, what, fine, the forces of good might have been naive over the last 20 years, but why do you think that was the case? Why was this, why was it easier for the forces of evil to manipulate technology uh, towards their own, uh, own ends? I mean, is that also an age old thing? Well, I think very specifically from the early 1970s on when what you could call neoliberalism, neoconservatism, um, there was a very strong argument dominating uh, debate around the world, which was a debate about uh, only self-interest matters, 
only profit matters. Uh, the public good is inefficient. Nation states laws are, are, are um, irrelevant. Um, the marketplace is dominant. So, so that the internet came into its own in the midst of the reign of uh, globalization and what I would call amorality. Amorality was the dominant force, you know, not immorality, not morality, not ethics, but amorality was what's being rewarded. Profit, short-term profit, you can do whatever you want. And it came right in the middle of that, um, uh, you know, with these libertarians. So there was no, it was a very weak moment for uh, people who have ethical standards to stand up and fight back because they've been losing since the early 70s, losing virtually every major international and national battle, governmental, whatever. The rules had been changing, the regulations had been going downhill. And so it actually hit at a, at a fragile moment and a very dangerous moment. And so it's taken 20 years to, for the forces of ethics, if you like, to start fighting their way back. And as you say in India, you're still in the midst of that battle. And I think the United States is right in the midst of that battle. I think um, Canadians more or less have, have crawled, scrambled their way to some extent out of it. We'll see, but you know, all of these things are to be played and you have to go uh, continent by continent, country by country to see where are they in this battle? How much are they willing to fight? How much are they willing to give up of this idea of profit, which is a false idea? Um, in order to get controls or a different force at play in the internet. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of food for thought, General Dallaire. And I think as a, you know, while you respond to what John has said, uh, just as something for you to, uh, for me to provoke you with, um, certainly in India, when we, we you know, the, 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 the concept of libertarianism or the, the term libertarianism isn't part of our political vocabulary over here. Right. Um, although you could argue that a lot of people uh, fall into that that framework of thinking, but uh, you know the, the term liberal and has which has been associated with the far left uh, has become almost like a slur. So left liberal uh, is somebody who is not worthy of engaging with because they are the complete opposite of the right, and the right is of course right because they are also in power. Um, so, you know, the, the vocabulary of our, of our politically charged landscape has also crept into the way the media represents certain voices, uh, certainly over here, but I'd love to hear you, uh, you know, come in on that. You can imagine when I was, would go to the United States, when I was a senator in our, uh, in our system of governance here, uh, and I would say that I am a ex-general who is part of the Liberal Party, how that was received and, and how warped the terminology was just by the expression of what it was. It, it, and I could see it in the eyes of those that, that I was speaking to that I had to explain uh, really what we, we stood for and that uh, we were an option uh, that was probably more centrist and a bit to the left, but not something uh, that you could fear of running away amok with all of the references of uh, the moral correctness of the past and sort of just let, let loose uh, the forces of, of, uh, of individuals dominate, uh, individual dominating the whole of the, of the population. I, I think that... Uh, uh, the naivety comes from the technology. That is, and it goes along with what John has been saying. People, when they created some magnificent changes in technology, uh, have looked at it as things that are good because it's, a, it's an advancement. It's a, a new, new means by which human beings will be able to interact and to and to change their way of life and and and, and the like, and it's sort of sort of like the NASA going into space and all the derivatives that we got out of that out of uh, that research, uh, that naivety sort of is uh, is erroneous because technology is not neutral. New weapons are not not neutral. 
you know, you might be making them for your protection, but they can fall very fast into the hands of others who can use them for other means. Uh, and in so doing, the frictions of our differences, when, first of all, you don't treat everyone as equals, as equal human beings to start with. And remember, for hundreds of years, Euros, the Eurocentric Caucasian considered everybody else as other. And so that has, yes, with the technology, transportation, education, and communication has evolved. But there's still this sense that not all humans are equal. So add to that the, 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 the frictions of some of the differences that do exist due to nationalism, due to race, to the color, to religion, and so on. You've got an inherent sort of uh, nucleus there that could be nurtured by something that can get inside there and actually pull out one of those and turn that very rapidly and instantaneously into an instrument of hate and destruction. That technology and that new ability to be real time with real human beings at the other end of this screen and being able to coalesce their thinking because you can hit massive numbers is the phenomenon that creates and moves things into a massive scale. And that's why uh, I'm uh, uh, my work on the prevention of uh, global mass atrocities uh, is looking at something like artificial intelligence, where we're trying to see how can we counteract so rapidly the injection of evil into the instruments that are being used for communications now. And, and uh, some of that, uh, again, can rapidly be countered uh, into the bad side of the house, uh, into the dark side. All right. it's, it's very interesting that you make that point about technology not being neutral because uh, uh, John Ralston saw that's exactly the opposite of what technology companies say. Uh, they say that we are neutral. Uh, the platforms that, that people are spreading this kind of propaganda and hate speech on say the platform per se is neutral and it is the editors of mainstream or mass media or traditional media that always had some kind of a bias or the filters of editorial decision making were ascribed to bias and so these platforms are there to provide a neutral and free alternative to the bias that's consumed. Uh, you know, just come in on that and I want you to also, uh, then I'll for, ask a follow-up question uh, also around that propaganda, but if you could just come in on, it's an interesting observation and, you know, I find myself battling this idea constantly uh, while talking to people saying, you can't just say that it's neutral because neutral stands for nothing then. Well, I mean, I think it, it comes back to this issue that that you know, by the time the internet started exploding, um, you had new generations coming along who were deeply upset with what was in place, which was, let's just call it this uh, uh, interest-based globalist theory, right? Self-interest as the dominant thing. And they knew that was wrong, but they couldn't figure out what, how to oppose it. And so it was quite natural that they would, see, they would, in a sense, embrace the original arguments of the internet, which was, hey, this is neutral, and you can come and use this whatever way you want. And so a lot of really great people embraced that idea and tried to, um, to, to use it as a neutral platform in which argument could take place and so on. And there's still people trying to do that today. I mean, I'm, I mean, I chose just to use Twitter, so I use Twitter. And, but I, I noticed, you know, I come in with something which is, you know, an interesting argument and somebody comes back with an interesting argument and two later, it's in black and white and, and basically the negative are dominating. And that seems to be the structure of the internet, which is it's far easier for people to uh, take it down a negative road than down an interesting creative road. And we see, I mean, lots of people have said this. I'm, I'm not at all is that, uh, saying is anything that, new about that. Yeah, is that to do with part of the technology speed. It's the part way of the people speed. behave? Well, it's part of the, I think it's, it's part of the speed that, you know, you can intervene so quickly with, you know, with the kind of thing that you said when you were, uh, which made boys think they were really smart when they were 16. You hmm. know, I mean, sort of funny, 
You know, you can interview with one of those really rude, snappy remarks and get away with it. People don't even know who you are, right? So yeah. you've lost all the responsibility of being in a room faced with other people, being in a newspaper with your name signed, all the things of, of limitation and responsibility. So you can see how that started out of the frustration against globalization. Oh, wow, we've got something free, something open, something neutral. And, and really people didn't stop to think to themselves, how does technology work? You know, They didn't actually, interestingly enough, go back to, you'll forgive, you've got two Canadians, back to the origins of the theories around communications, which were Harold Innes, University of Toronto, who then influenced Marshall McLuhan, and Marshall McLuhan and Harold Innes created something called the Toronto School with about six philosophers of communication. And they understood, go back and read their stuff. They understood from the very beginning what the positives and the dangers would be. And where we are today is exactly where they said we would be. In, they said it in the 50s and 60s before the machines were invented. That's what's so fascinating. They were real, you know, they, they thought their way through what was going to physically happen. And I think only now are people starting to realize that in order to deal with this, any technology of communication, there have to be rules. Hmm. Otherwise, the negative will dominate because it's far easier to call someone an insect than it is to deal with the complexities of humanity and ethics. Far easier, right. faster, far faster. And that also brings me to, to a sort of follow-up question which ties into the theme of our conversation, which is that there seems to have been created, uh, certainly in the, in the last two decades of the rise of the internet and then uh, social media, uh, a broad public mistrust for traditional media. Uh, and that has been fed by these concepts of citizen journalism or the, the democratic uh, free space that, uh, that, that social media platforms allow um, the public to kind of express their own thoughts and ideas, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, and so those ideas and citizen journalism, which is like perceived to be the, the final truth because some non-journalist has put it out there, um, you know, it, it, it becomes the news. I mean, it's like you, you say, you know, you tell a lie enough times and it becomes the truth. You see something which is unverified enough times and it becomes the truth. I think that, that um, I, I remember when I brought out Voltaire's Bastards, you know, so this sort of thousand page book that, you know, people are still reading all over the place. And, and, and I, w I decided I wouldn't do stuff on television, be sort of the hamburger meat of the two minute interview, you know, that, that I would go into halls and, and give speeches and answer questions. And it was a lot of fun. And a thousand people would turn up, 2000 people. And, and, and um, uh, this is before Jaipur, the, the fantastic Jaipur festival, which I think is the greatest festival in the world. Um, honestly, I do, it really is amazing in the audience. Um, and and uh, uh, there would always um, be uh, people who would stand up and say, well, you know, what's happening to the, the mainstream media? Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're falling apart. What are we going to do? They're the right wing are getting control of them. And I would say at that in the 90s, the early 90s, I'd say, look, you know, because of the Internet, you can go a group of you and you can create your own newspaper. You don't have to be. The Times of India or the New York Times or the Globe and Mail. You don't have to be that. That's kind of middle class concept that only existed for about 50, 60 years. It wasn't like that before. It was, it was a few people with a newspaper in the 19th century. You can set up your own newspaper uh, and put your own opinions out there. And I would suggest you do that. It won't cost much money at all. But the definition of setting up a newspaper online is the same as the other ones, which is you have a responsibility as the publisher and the editor and the writers to think about what you're saying and what is true and what is not true. It's not simply about opinion. You can have any opinion you want within the limits of not spreading hate and having a concern about some kind of truth. And I, and I remember in the 90s, people thought I was kind of crazy saying this. Now you've got the, the positive side of the internet is there are some fabulous people out there with online newspapers, you know, and there's some of them are really, really, and they're getting better and better and better. And I read a lot of them. 
you know, I look at BuzzFeed and I look at, I try to remember some of the others that I look at every day because they're fast and they have interesting information and they're shorter articles, but they're, they're aiming at things that are actually happening. So in a way, it's a part answer to the people who are driving hatred. But the problem is you, there has to be this sense of responsibility and there have to be regulations. There just have to be. Because yeah. without that, you will have the equivalent of Rwanda uh, and the equivalent of the Nazis. That's what you will get. And that's what you're getting a lot in places like the United States or what you've got in, um, in, in Myanmar. In, in India too. Uh, there and, are new channels that are that are uh, propagating a political agenda and often um, at the cost of reporting on real news and real issues that matter to people. But that's that's a whole separate debate and maybe we'll have that another time. But a general delay on this issue of, of uh, regulation, you know, mm -hmm. it's a slippery slope. The term mm -hmm. itself is slippery because um, when you have governments that are turning uh, authoritarian, whether wherever, in whichever part of the globe, uh, who is going to determine what those regulations are? Who is going to enforce those regulations? Because um, uh, just again, as an example, in India, we, you know, there are there are guidelines for self-regulation for the traditional media, the Editors Guild or the National Broadcasting Standards Association, and these were sort of, you know, uh, uh, w the media policing itself, and and also trying to ensure that it was holding up the principles of good journalism. And yet you've had situations with this sort of partisanship in the media uh, result in senior editors of news networks or newspapers saying, well, we don't believe in these standards and we're walking out of the association and setting up our own. So self-regulation clearly hasn't proven to be uh, of great value either. What do you think uh, could be a potential solution? In in John is absolutely right that uh, there must be a creation of a systematic methodology of rules surrounding uh, the application of this technology and how it's being being used uh, and uh, that uh, within the constraints of nation states, which is the instrument we have now, uh, there are uh, the weaknesses in regards to non-democratic states, the states that are being overtaken by certain authorities or uh, subversive elements even that are given more leeway than they should because uh, the policing of the internet is so weak uh, in, in trying to bring people to a responsible state of, of, of uh, journalism or in information passage. That's why I, I tend to think and move to the global environment. I, I don't think that the nation state instruments are going to be the ultimate solution to balancing out this thing becoming a weapon of evil to this thing becoming a weapon of stability and peace that is a guarantor of peace and advancement of, of human rights. Uh, I think that there's got to be a grander scale instrument that can be created and must be created for humanity to be able to use this to maximize the potential of humanity in its ensemble and not just uh, in regions or in different uh, areas with our biases and our limitations and, and our uh, way of life and all the traditions and so on. This is a global instrument. This can be a global uh, weapon. Uh, this can move us as it seems to be moving the right into positions of power well beyond even their imagination throughout the world it's influencing. So what are the tools, in fact, to bring this into a balanced, responsible arena? And I think that as John described so well, the creators of this capability who are so economically well established and so on, is, is that the bringing the realization of their power that they sought by creating it. Because if you create something like that, you know you're going to have power. You know you're going to influence. As right. an example, you know, the people who created Google, right? Mm. Tell me who doesn't use Google, except 
Google can uh, uh, digitize anything that's out of print. So who's controlling that? What if they're fiddling with what's out of print and putting it out there and modifying it? What if Google goes rogue? And so what's going to replace Google? And if that's the source of information that the world is guiding itself on, then we're into a significantly different scenario than in within a nation trying to control the communications. We're into the world shifting gears. And so I'm sort of arguing that there's got to be a higher plane capability. And I, I was mentioning to John yesterday that the Secretary General of the UN put out a, a directive. Uh, it, it's called the United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech. Came out in May of 2019. And although it, it, it alludes a lot, of course, to the technology, the answers or the, 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 the instruments are, are of an era of the past. You know, it's the old thing, the old way of doing it. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the old sort of disciplines working individually uh, and trying to maybe coordinate. It, there's not a global thought and a global grasping and a higher plane of authority that's being created by this higher plane of communications and power. Because behind all that is power. And right. so what's the instrument of the future for that? If anyone has the answer to that question, then you know, we, maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. But we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, so let me just try and pose some of those. One of them, of course, I think someone named Shrey had asked this question about um, you know, who is going to hold editors accountable. And General Dallaire's comments, I think, right now should... Uh, shed some light on that question for you. But, um, you know, uh, I'm going to throw this out to, uh, I'm going to take a few questions together and then we can go one by one uh, when we answer them. But uh, someone in Mohan has asked, why is it that toxic content uh, is more attractive to viewers? Because uh, a, a lot of news channels, particularly in, in, in India, that have been um, Sort of at the front, at the sort of uh, top of the game on this spread of toxic content, also have the highest viewership and the highest ratings. So you know what's the explanation for that? If if somebody does have one, um, then somebody else has asked. Um, Upendra has asked uh, why uh, journalism is dying everywhere and how does one revive it? So let's try and take uh, these two uh, first, and then we'll get to some more. So John, maybe. You want to take uh, take one of them? Uh, yes, but I, just one one comment. You know, uh, uh, Romy and I are, are in agreement. Our focuses are slightly different, but we're in agreement. This is not going to happen at one level. Mm. This is not going to happen in one place. You're going to have to have uh, agreement at, at 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 national and regional levels, but it, none of this matters if you don't have any agreements at the international level. And 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 I just say, you know, Penn Penn International. Uh, we started. We have our charter that I talked about the uh, unlimited and and hatred versus hatred. Uh, but we started putting out when I was president a series of statements of working documents, international, borderless on a series of subjects, uh, translation, minority language rights, and so on. And the first one we did was on, on the internet, and it's called the, the Penn Declaration on Digital Freedom. And it was the first serious attempt to actually, it's in one page, it's 10 items, to say this, these are actually the elements of digital freedom and how they have to be used and controlled. We started at the international level because there was no language Mm. There was no language about what is the proper use mm. and what are the, what is the improper use. And this, is, this has always existed. That's why one could talk about good and evil, about ethics versus amorality or immorality, because we have thousands of years of knowing when people are stepping outside the bounds of what allows civilizations to exist with racism and hatred and so on. So it, it, it's simply that, that you, know, you have to put in place uh, uh, language which everybody can understand which says we know what evil is how does our knowledge of evil apply to the use of the internet how do we update our language so that we know when things are going wrong and we can react 
properly and structure things properly at the international level and the national level vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the internet. And then, so when you ask the question, why does toxic content seem to be so much easier to get responses to, it really goes back to what I said earlier, which is that <clears throat> if, you know, it takes a lot of effort to be a good citizen. It takes a lot of effort to uh, believe in empathy, to respect the other. This is what takes effort, restraint, looking beyond yourself. And how do you figure that out? So wh when a mechanism which doesn't require that of you comes along, like the internet, then the toxic content has free run. It really has right. free run. And the people who um, are, are most comfortable with toxic content sound like leaders. You know, they actually sound like leaders for quite a while till you realize what kind of hatred um, they're delivering. And we're still in that very early stage where the people who don't believe in that kind of in that kind of speech and are unwilling to accept what it leads to. You only have to look at the United States, you know, President Trump saying, well, they were all there were good people on both sides. Right. No, there weren't good people on both sides. It was evil on one side. You know, and we know this through our history. Um, we haven't put in place the mechanisms which people at the international level and the national level can say, stop, stop, either because they're the owners or they're the editors. So, but if you have the mechanisms in place, both technical and, 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 and linguistic, so that people know how to respond, then, um, then you know how to deal with it when an authoritarian regime or a semi-authoritarian regime starts pretending that they're defending freedom of expression when they're doing the exact opposite. We're unable to respond to that because we don't have what, you know, what Romeo's talking about and what I'm talking about. We don't have any of this in place. So people can get away, you know, the Russians, and so can get away with pretending that they're standing up for Russia. The Chinese can get away with saying, there is a Chinese way. You know, I'm terribly sorry. I know that there are several Chinese ways and one of them has to do with humanism and respect for the other. You know, and the other has to do with throwing people in jail for opening their mouth. Yeah, there's an interesting sort of follow up question to that. And I'm going to uh, ask General Dallaire to come in on that, because, you know, this idea that, no, there, I there isn't an equivalence to be made between the two sides, as uh, as uh, John pointed out in the example that he was giving. Um, but we have a question saying that, can it be possible that one side doesn't realize what he or she is writing or saying is actually hate speech, what might be hate speech for some may seem logical to the other. So who gets to decide uh, what speech is hate speech and how ethical is that to give one, one group or one entity the, the right to make that decision? Uh, this again goes back to the point that John was making that, you know, this attempt by those who propagate violence or propagate division to create what, what I like to term as false equivalences, um, you know, between two sides, or they're both good people, or they're both, they both have a point. No, they both don't have a point. One has a stronger point than the other. So uh, who gets to choose? Who gets to make that decision? Yeah, it's interesting how Trump uses that too, isn't it? That, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I think that what, I think we've entered an era where people feel more vulnerable because of that technology. Uh, it, there, uh, it, it's there, it's prevalent, it's got all kinds of ramifications, but it does also uh, it, it intrude and can intrude and in fact can create within people an automatic defensive position in regards to, well, I better watch out what I'm doing here. Uh, I better know what I'm doing. I better try to to, to master and not press the wrong button at the wrong time and God knows what, what, what will happen. That vulnerability plays on the frictions that exist within the, the, the individuals with the rest of their society. It could be economic, it could be religious, it could be a, a whole variety of reasons of these frictions or simply not liking the way the, 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 the food smells from the next door neighbor and, it, uh, and, and that bothers them. These frictions uh, are the basis for people to build animosity. And so that animosity scenario 
is, is just fertile ground for somebody to qualify it, to, to make it a reference of a group, of, an, of, a, of a reason for these people to be not like you. And if they're not like you, then they are either better than you or they're worse than you. And so too often people by their own pretentiousness will consider others less and as such will react to that. And so when somebody through these means reinforces that in such easy language, in the most basic gross ways and, and visually, remember we're playing with, and, and John's quite right, the words are significant, but the right. visuals that this thing is providing the visuals are overwhelming. Let me use the example of ISIS. ISIS recruited thousands of children, young people, to join their uh, movement, to become child soldiers, to become brides of child soldiers in ISIS. And they did that with the most effective means of evil demonstration of power and of solutions uh, to human beings. And, and using children to do it. And so I would argue that in our societies, and when many societies where the young people are dominating the demographics of those countries, we have got to target them. We've got to find a way to talk to them, to make them realize the enormous potential of this thing, and also the enormous impact that it has and how they could create peer, peer responses around the world in a positive way, just like they can uh, generate uh, anti-Semitism or any uh, anti-Muslim uh, hatred and so on uh, by using that same instrument. So the, I think that the, the marriage of words to the image, real time, I see you, I know you're breathing, I know you're in another country, you're thousands and thousands of miles away from me, but I see you real time. That is a revolution, and that is a power base that people can maximize if they've got uh, something negative to present. How do you present the positive is what we're trying to break into the, the code of advancing things like human rights. Right. So uh, we just have time for uh, one more question. So I'm going to club a few together, John. And I think the, these are possibly something that you could uh, weigh in on. And they're all around the future of journalism. So of course, that mm -hmm. one question about whether journalism is dying and if does it need public funding for revival. Uh, the second that's tied into this is whether uh, journalism as a career is a dangerous and vicious pursuit what is the advice you would give people who want to be uh, journalists about their commitment to a public good? And the, the third is, um, from the perspective of the consumer of news and information, how do you, in this era of hyper-connectivity and multiple sources of information, distinguish uh, the ethical and the, uh, and the unethical or the true and the false? Uh, or the propaganda or and uh, and uh, fact i mean how do you how do you make all these distinctions so i think they're all three very interesting questions they're somehow linked and that would be a good note for us to also conclude the conversation on so i'm going to ask you to take all all those together well, you know first of all you know if you look at the role of the journalist through history the king's fool you know the king's fool was a journalist the job of the king's fool was the one person in court who didn't want anything and didn't have any money and was funny and, yeah. and, and kept knocking down the people who were, through dead seriousness, trying to make money or drive the king to do the wrong thing. So the, journalism has always existed. And unfortunately, it's only a very brief period of time where journalists had the advantages of the middle class, a proper pay and stability. I mean, most of the history of journalism, journalists have been on the outside and have been risk takers. So, I mean, you know, become a journalist, embrace poverty, you know, it's, and I think that's really important to know that's the history of journalism. You know, the New York Times is not the history of journalism, middle class, well paid with a nice house. That is not the history of journalism. Secondly, uh, and that's because you're an outsider. You're not an insider. Um, secondly, I think that um, 
it is incredibly risky today. You know, the numbers of, of journalists being killed every year is going up and up. And this is a sign of all the things we've been describing that once you let loose the dogs of hatred, not just the dogs of war, the dogs of hatred, then violence follows. Violence comes and it will be turned on the people who speak up. And they will be the journalists who are the bravest and who are on the edge in some small town pointing out corruption, pointing out pollution or whatever is in Mexico, for example, or, or in India or in Brazil. Um, and so this is a very dangerous, edgy life. You have to believe in it to want to do it. And I think you have to really think carefully to yourself, what are your standards? And what is the language that goes with the standards? And what are you willing to give up in order to say those things? Because I've said to journalism students again and again and again, within one week of you having a normal job in a normal kind of journalistic place, somebody with power is going to come up to you and say, well, actually, Mary, um, you know, actually, you know, that's a wonderful story, but you know, we have a bit of a problem with an advertiser or we have a bit of, you know, and you have to already know the first week you're there, how you're going to respond and what you're going to do, because that's going to determine the rest of your career in an organization or independently. It's, it's really is work for courageous people, clever people who know how to get around things, but courageous uh, people. And I think the other thing is that I'm not, you know, I'm not convinced that the that the apolitical idea of journalism, which existed, you know, through the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe, was really the right one. It was very comfortable, middle class. But it, but but journalism has always been about taking a position, not telling a lie, but taking a position with your arguments. And the question is. When are you going too far? When are you actually becoming the, uh, you know, the, the tool of a, an extreme religious movement that wants to, you know, do away with another religious movement, or extreme political movement that wants to do away with another political movement? You have to be able to recognize that what that is. And I think one of the hardest things for people coming along now is we have this technology which which all described, and I think Romeo's done the best job of describing how new it is how fast it is, how immediate it can be. But at the same time, some things don't change. And you have to understand what happens when you say something like this. We've got thousands of years of history of what telling the truth does, even with an opinion, versus what lying does. We know what this looks like. You know, if This is just the latest technology to do it. It happens to be a, you know, a, a speed machine, a D speed demon that goes faster and wider, you know, but it doesn't take away that speed, does not remove the responsibility of any of us here to say, well, if I write that, I'm unleashing the kind of thing that was unleashed in Rwanda or in Myanmar. We know that. So it's not good enough not to know what happens when you say these things just because it's going fast. The technology does not erase either responsibility or memory unless we allow it to. And memory, you know, I wrote a book called On Equilibrium and talking about the six key qualities of humans. Well, one of them is memory. If you can't remember what worked in the past, what worked yesterday, and what led to evil, then, you know, as, as many people have historians have said, you're just a child. If you can't remember what the effect of this kind of language and action will be. So I'm not making an old fashioned argument for the past. I'm making a uh, a, a yesterday, to me, today, tomorrow argument that memory is about yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you have to know what that means and what that's going to mean as a journalist when you open your mouth or write something down. Right. Thank you very much. And I think that, that that's good advice for consumers of information as well, uh, that you're actually part of the information cycle. And uh, I mean, it was very eloquently put that technology uh, uh, is not, does not erase either responsibility or memory. And I think that goes as much for the journalist or the citizen journalist writing or posting uh, something as it does for somebody who's choosing to share a particular piece of information or comment on a piece of information. Uh, I think I think we all have to be much more cognizant of the, the value uh, that, Im that is imbued in the language and the vocabulary that we use, uh, the manner in which we speak. 
and this idea uh, that there that everything is always equal and there's always a, a what about or a, a what then uh, you know associated with every incident that is possibly problematic, hateful, a uh, propagandist, uh, as the case may be. General Dallaire and John Rolson so thank you both very much uh, for um, this wonderfully engaging session. I know that I'm going to be asking all my students of media studies to listen to uh, this conversation very, very closely. And I hope that others who are involved in any aspect of the media uh, do sort of take the time to listen to some of these, uh, these arguments that, that both of you have made. Thank you both very much. Thank you, News Laundry and Media Rumble. And uh, thank you, JLF, as well, for, uh, for this great opportunity. Well done. Thank you. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.